What up on this is my Q&A for this week, Q&A episode 6 for December 11th, 2008. The first question comes in from King Andy 1992 and he asks, ROH fans and wrestling fans in general are very divided on Nigel McGuinness. Is he just a lariat monkey or a technically gifted wrestler in your opinion? I would definitely side with the side saying that he's definitely technically gifted in the ring. He's definitely not a lariat monkey. That's just something a lot of fans where, say if a wrestler has a certain base of moves or something he does, you know, repeatedly in matches, he'll automatically be called, you know, a lariat monkey, clothesline monkey, or a spot monkey, you know, whereas if they do stuff like, you know, Jack Evans, Jeff Hardy, or AJ Styles, just very general lace generalizations of wrestlers and definitely Nigel's not like that now I could understand why some people might not be fans of Nigel against due to the fact if you're not into the um, you know uh, slow downing of slow down of matches and you know the more mat wrestling over you know the fast pace style then you might not be a fan of him but I'm more into the mat based technical style of wrestling, so that's pretty much the main reason why I'm, you know, a huge fan of him, Austin Aries, and Brian Danielson a lot. Definitely, like I, uh, you said, you know, which side would I choose? Definitely technically gifted as far as Nigel goes. He's been a good uh, champion and going on, you know, if he passes final battle uh, weekend, he'll actually be able to call himself the second longest reigning ROH world champion right behind Samoa Joe, because if he passes final battle weekend, he defeats... Uh, Brian Danielson's 15-month reign, which is definitely mind-boggling, because I didn't think, you know, anyone would be able to defeat that, especially um, it's only been, you know, at this point, two years after that, and I never expected to be uh, Nigel McGuinness be the one to do it, and um, next question is from Glurples, and he asks, um, which do you think is better, WWE or TNA, and why? And this is going to be one of those where I'm going to kind of answer and kind of not, um, because pretty much WWE and TNA, I just view them as mainstream wrestling organizations. And at times, WWE does some stuff I like better, and sometimes TNA does some stuff I think that's better. Um, it's whether as, you know, if you count like, say, say if I say, which company do I think this month in wrestling is doing better, WWE or TNA? I would probably choose WWE just because they've been building up stuff a little better. They're Television shows have been a whole lot better than Impact as far as at least Raw goes. And some of SmackDown has been at least okay. And I really, you know, build it off of what, you know, the both pay-per-views as far as cards produce. And it looks like, you know, this coming Sunday's Armageddon pay-per-view is obviously going to produce better than Final Resolution. At least we hope so. I can't see it doing any worse than that, especially with the card we got going into this Sunday at Armageddon. So, like I said, as far as, you know, which one I think is better... Sometimes one's better than the other. It really depends on what they do. I just view them as both mainstream organizations where they're probably, they're more of the same. That's what they are. I mean, I'm more into, you know, Ring of Honor, PWG, the independent wrestling organizations, Shimmer, and, you know, a lot of the Japanese wrestling promotions like Dragon Gate, Pro Wrestling, Noah, New Japan, and All Japan over, you know, the mainstream products of WWE and TNA. Not saying that I don't, you know, can't enjoy stuff WWE and TNA do, but... I just, you know, prefer the independent wrestling and Japanese wrestling over WWE and CNA, at least on most occasions. And um, next question is from Coffee Ninja B8, and he asks, if you could bring back one wrestler from the dead, who would it be and why? Um, easily, it would probably be Eddie Guerrero. Eddie Guerrero is one of those wrestlers that, you know, died prematurely, shouldn't have died as young as he did, and, you know, he finally, you know, got to the level where he... Um, defeated his addiction, and it looked like he was starting to do good. Then he ended up um, die, dying back in 2005, back in November of 2005, and that was pretty much due to, you know, some steroid abuse and obviously his past drug problems as well, and definitely a sad thing. He's no longer here with us. Um, he's definitely, you know, a great, you know, overall wrestler, good entertainer. Just, you know, one of those wrestlers I really enjoyed seeing pretty much all the time, whatever he did, whether it was some of his uh, comical stuff, his matches, pretty much everything I would say he did most of the time always deliver. I mean, he was probably one of the very few persons I could say that when he was doing something with uh, Chavo Guerrero that I would actually pay attention to, and that's probably the last time I was ever paid attention to Chavo, or at least 
could take him maybe a little serious more than what he is now, obviously. And then the next question is from Instant Classic G1, and there's two questions from him. And the first one is, out of the three main U.S. promotions, ROH, WWE, and CNA, which one produces the best T-shirts? And as far as this, um, I would probably say WWE. WWE at times produces some of the best ones, and recently they've been doing a better job than what they normally do. Um, you know, as far as wrestling T-shirts, I like the ones more with like the original logos instead of you know the plaster of just the wrestler's face on there. That looks you know very generic, and you know that would pass back in the late '80s, maybe the Attitude Era, but people would much rather you know have a T-shirt with like cool design, but still it would represent the wrestler or the wrestling organization. I think that those ones work out better. So I would say WWE right now is probably doing good. TNA has produced some good ones with like Christian Cage's ones, LAX, the Motor City Machine Guns, and a couple other ones as well. But then, just like you know, any company, they'll produce at least a couple of ones that are very terrible, which especially two of them being the Kevin Nash t-shirt, which is the name Nash on the front, um, which NB Wrestler has pretty much made famous as far as that t-shirt goes. And um, the other one is um, the AJ Styles, the one where he's just doing the flying forearm. It just says flying forearm on the back. I mean, come on. Some independent wrestling companies would even come out with some better product than that. I mean, a fucking five-year-old looked like he made those shirts. And Ring of Honor, I would say, Ring of Honor is actually starting to finally produce some good t-shirts for a change. I mean, um, I actually like the ones, you know, as far as their, you know, wrestling company logo. I think most of the times those have been good, but as far as their other shirts, they've been pretty generic. But now they're starting to actually produce some good ones like the Roger Strong t-shirt, the Delirious t-shirt, the Age of the Fall t-shirt. Um, the, unfortunately, they still haven't came out with one they produced by themselves as far as a good Brian Danielson one. They have the Brian Danielson Revolution one, and they have the new one they just came out with. I'm not really keen on either one of them, but I guess if I had to choose one, I'll probably choose the newer one because it look at least has somewhat of a cool design and it's not doesn't look like a generic shirt like the other one does. I mean, probably Brian Danielson's best one T-shirt he actually has out is probably the one he uh, sells on his MySpace personally by himself. I don't know why Ring of Honor wouldn't try to you know come out with that one instead of you know making pretty too much pretty much in my opinion too lackluster T-shirts, but. Um, I'd say like WWE, TNA produces some good ones. The Ring of Honor is finally starting to produce some good ones. And um, um, next question is the same person is, what are your thoughts on Mike Awesome as a wrestler and his time in ECW? Uh, Mike Awesome, I would say, is definitely one of the most gifted big man, or was the most gifted big man. I mean, um, and another wrestler just like Eddie Guerrero uh, died at a very young age. Obviously, he didn't die of steroid overdose. He uh committed suicide, but nonetheless, you know, still sad that he's gone from us, um, and Mike Austin was a great uh, performer, definitely did a lot of good stuff that you wouldn't expect a big man to do of his size and stature, you wouldn't expect him to be able to work the way he did, you know, I loved his stuff he did with uh, FMW, then his stuff in ECW, obviously after, you know, his ECW title reigns and him going to WCW, that was pretty much the end of his wrestling career, other than, you know, maybe that one last night we actually were able to see Mike Awesome at his full talent ability when um, they did the first one-night stand where him and Masato Tanaka took on each other and kind of, you know, rejuvenating their long-running feud they had with each other back in ECW. And definitely enjoyed him back in ECW. Maybe the way he left ECW back in the day, I lost a little respect for him, but he still was a great performer. And, you know, definitely another wrestler that, you know, sadly um, died uh, very young due to suicide, just like, you know, a lot of other wrestlers like the Von Erichs, unfortunately. Um, then the next uh, question is from Heartbreak Kid 2112 and he asks, what are your thoughts on Shawn Michaels, and how much do you think he has left in the tank? Do you think he will hold the WWE Championship or WWE World Title, Heavyweight Title ever again? When do you think he'll um, end up retiring and hanging hanging it up? Now, as far as my thoughts on Shawn Michaels, definitely think he's a great performer. Uh, back in the day, obviously he was very cocky and full of himself. I think he's obviously, you know, after his return back in 2002, I think you he obviously can tell that he's not like that anymore, and he's 
Definitely has always been a great performer, even back in the day when I knew he was like that. I overlooked it. I mean, always I thought he was a great performer. And um, as far as him possibly ever either getting the world title or the WWE title, uh, I think there's at least one chance for one last reign before he retires. As far as him retiring, I could see him at least wrestling two to three more years, especially now since he's on this very limited schedule and he's not doing extreme amount of house shows and he's not even doing extreme amount of TV all the time. And when he does do TV, not all the time he's wrestling. So with that case, you know, two or three more years as far as an in-ring performer. And he's probably going to be one of those guys that will do, you know, some type of talent relation thing for WWE after he retires. He'll pretty much be with WWE as far as some, in some capacity, pretty much, I think, all his life, you know, after he even retires. Um, like, you know, Triple H will be, obviously, and um, a couple other people, you know, will always, you know, somehow be with WWE in the future. I, I can see him being one of them. And the next question is from Irish Shock, and it's, um, he asks, um, from a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate WrestleMania 9? And oh my god, um, I haven't watched this in a long, long time, and it's um, definitely noted why I haven't watched this in a long time, just because how terrible this show is. Um, easily, this is probably the worst WrestleMania of all time. Um, the only other one that comes close to it is possibly WrestleMania 11, but I felt at least WrestleMania 11 had somewhat of an okay match with uh, Shawn Michaels and Diesel, and it built up to their match. They had the uh, following pay-per-view when they had the No Holds Barred match, so at least that was some purpose to it. And um, As stupid as the uh, whole um, LT and Bam Bam Bigelow thing was, it was probably the best orchestrated you know, wrestler versus you know outsider of wrestling that's probably ever been done, so that kind of gets a little over WrestleMania. Now, as far as the scale... You know, obviously, since I haven't seen it in a long time, and, but I know how terrible it is, probably, maybe at best, they probably 3.5 or a 4 out of 10 probably being the highest, um, especially since I don't think there was even anything on there that I even could say I enjoyed watching, especially, you know, the main event was very lackluster with Bret Hart and Yoko, and I don't want to even start with um, Hogan coming out there winning the title in 90 seconds. I'm not a Hogan fan, so... Definitely um, didn't like that either, so that didn't help the show out and definitely hurt the ending of the show. And uh, next question is from NASCAR93 fan, and he asks, What do you think has been WWE's best pay-per-view this year, and what do you think has been their worst pay-per-view they have put on? In my opinion, WrestleMania 24 was the best pay-per-view of the year, not just this year, but of all time. Um, and... Uh, of all time, and probably the weakest, in my opinion, was the Royal Rumble. Not to say it was a bad event, but in my opinion, overall, it was overall good, but in my opinion, John Cena killed it by winning it. Obviously, he states that he isn't a fan of John Cena, and you're not probably not going to like my answer to this, and that's, um, you know, the Royal Rumble is probably WWE's best pay-per-view, in my opinion, this year. I know I'm probably one of the only people that's really hyped it up to a level, saying it's my favorite event of WWE this year, I just enjoyed it a whole lot, and you know, I'm not a John Cena hater, um, wouldn't say I'm a diehard fan of him, but I actually can enjoy him, and um, I think he is, you know, a good performer, especially for WWE, for what he does, and you know, he's liked by a lot of fans, and it's understandable, um, WWE always pushing him the way they do, but he hasn't even, you know, just recently, it has just until recently, he, he um, after his um, long, you know, title run he had before, it took him, you know, almost 13 months to finally win the world title back, which a lot of people already expected him to probably be world champion sometime earlier this year, which didn't happen, so I would say the Rumble is probably my best, my favorite WWE event of this year, because I enjoyed the Rumble match a lot, you know, a good, um, you know, shock um, return of John Cena, and good way they played that off, um, enjoyed both of the title match with, with Randy Orton and um, Jeff Hardy, and the Edge and Rey Mysterio match, the uh, MVP versus Flair match was, you know, not the greatest, but it was at least somewhat enjoyable, at least watchable. And the Jericho and JBL match they had there at the Rumble, back then for storyline development, it made sense, but unfortunately after that, they really didn't lead it into anything that good. It just kept on getting worse and worse, and I think they just ended up ending that feud on Raw. They didn't even save it for a pay-per-view, so that just shows you how bad that feud was. And as far as um, 
what I thought was the worst WWE pay-per-view this year, I would either, you know, say Great American Bash, um, either Great American Bash or Judgment Day. And I'll, I would definitely say um, Great American Bash goes over on um, uh, on Judgment Day just due to the fact that Great American Bash, I don't think, had anything that was at least enjoyable on there at, at that show at all. And, you know, Judgment Day at least had the okay um, Edge and Undertaker match, but they had that, you know, kooky, I think, you know, no contest or when the title got reversed or something. But other than that, that, that match was pretty good. So, you know, at least you got a good quality match on there. So I would say that was easily the worst pay of the year, the Great American Bash from WWE. And, um... Okay. Next question is from Bulligan01, and there's three questions um, that are asked. Um, what would you consider Ring of Honor's best feud of this year? My personal favorite is the Jimmy Jacobs and Austin Aries one. Totally got to agree with that. The Austin and Jimmy, Austin Aries and Jimmy Jacobs feud has been excellent. You know, a lot of good storytelling from them too. A lot of good matches they've put on against each other. You know, a lot of good stuff. You know, especially the way it got built up with the whole you know, outburst of what happened with um, Lacey and Jimmy Jacobs, and then it got put into the here, and that long-running uh, storyline they had with that, then Aries got involved, and Aries and Jacobs then been doing a good job as far as their storyline with each other and as far as their feud. So definitely I would say that's easily Ring of Honor's best feud of this year so far, and um, as far as probably the whole year as far as Ring of Honor goes, um, since it, you know, did, since it, just recently ended at the, well, not ended, but, you know, as far as their series of matches that they had, just, you know, their final series with the I Quit match was at the Rising Above pay-per-view tape, which is going to be airing, and um, I think January 16th, I think that's the date when it's going to start airing. And the next question from the same person, if Undertaker's undefeated streak at WrestleMania were ever broken, who would you like to see break it? Um, as far as person, I think I don't think the Undertaker um, undefeated streak at WrestleMania is ever going to be touched. I think it's going to I think he's going to stay undefeated. But if he's defeated by someone, there was one idea and rumor that was put out. I guess an internet rumor and an idea that WWE booking had at one point, or at least this is going to be something they were planning to do within the next two or three years within one of the WrestleManias with Undertaker. And it was the idea where they're in a playoff of um, Ted DiBiase bringing in The Undertaker back at Survivor Series 1990 and obviously play it off that, you know, Ted DiBiase Jr. is now with WWE and Ted DiBiase was going to help him. And then he was going to manage, I guess, his son or some, something or another and entangle it that way. And that was the way it was going to be built up. And if they would do something like that where it would be Ted DiBiase Jr. or anybody that would defeat Undertaker, it would definitely... Um, I don't know if it would help them. That it would definitely help their career a lot. But the bad thing is, you know, is obviously they're obviously going to be have to be a heel, and to, they're obviously going to have to be a very strong heel, very, you know, a, a, at least a wrestler that's believable defeating him. They'll have to build someone up very good. So if they would try to do this uh, whole rumor of Teddy Biazzi Jr. Um, they would definitely have to build him up a lot. And I mean build him up a lot where it's believable he can defeat Undertaker, especially since how many uh, good talent that Undertaker has defeated at WrestleMania. Now, there is a good list of people he's defeated at WrestleMania that are terrible, but I would say you know there's more better than bad on his list of resumes of defeating people at WrestleMania. So that would be one thing I would like to see. And definitely if they would ever go the route of person being um Defeating Undertaker at WrestleMania would really help that wrestler's career out. And I wouldn't I would definitely like to see them do that with Undertaker at his last uh, match and have his last match be at a, a WrestleMania and not even do it in a way where it has to maybe be a you know heel versus face or something like that. It could be something like a passion of the torch. I wouldn't mind seeing it done that way. The next question is from the same person. I have heard rumors that Lita was planning on jumping to the TNA. I personally don't see that ever happening. But if she did, what would you? Th what would be your thoughts on that? TNA seriously needs uh, her to help shape out the Knockouts division, either as a trainer or as an active um, competitor. And as far as um, Lita, obviously these have been rumors that ever since you know she left WWE um, or you know retired from WWE um, back, I think in was it 2006? Um, I think that was when it was and. Um, 
after that, you know, there's obviously, you know, people speculating that maybe she's going to go to TNA. Um, since it hasn't happened yet, I highly doubt it will. And it seems like, you know, what she's done in the wrestling career now, she still does, you know, autograph signings and appearances at, I guess, indie shows. But that's pretty much seems like all she's doing right now. And she's, I guess, focusing on her um, music with uh, her group, the Lucha Gores. And I guess that's what she's mostly focusing on right now, other than wrestling and I don't. I couldn't see her going to TNA, but definitely, you know, TNA with their knockouts division, they would need someone, or at least uh, some wrestlers, maybe from the Shimmer organization, to really help out the knockouts division. Because after Gail Kim's no longer there, that's a huge void that's been uh, not been able to be filled yet. And maybe a couple talents like Sarah Del Rey, um, Daisy Hayes, Sarah Stock, Mischief, or you know, definitely get. Um, Raisha Saeed and get her out of that character and have her just portray the gimmick she does, which is cheerleader Melissa. Um, and that definitely could be one that really could rejuvenate the knockouts division and make it definitely seem, you know, different from WWE, obviously. And if they uh, wouldn't mind them seeing, like, someone like, you know, Lita in TNA, but I think, you know, her time, you know, as far as the hype, which maybe would have got. Uh, built if she would have went to TNA, I think that's pretty much died off. Even though I know there's still pretty much a good amount of Lita fans. Since I get another, I get another question um, concerning Lita. I think coming up after the next question, and the next question is from Furby 2056. Do you think? Uh, do you see WWE ever giving Umaga a push to the uh, major, to a major world po world title upon his return? or even doing an angle where it re it's revealed that he can speak. Um, as far as them doing something where it looks like they'll do an angle where he'll finally speak, obviously that's going to happen at some point or another unless they you know, find some other manager like um, Amando Alejandro Estrada, since he's no longer with WWE, to possibly you know, be the mouthpiece of Umaga, which definitely, definitely if they want to go the route of him not speaking, which I think they've already done something where him... He was speaking already, so I think they might have already went that route. As far as him maybe winning a world title or getting pushed to a major title on his return, can't really see that happen unless you count the U.S. title a major title, which I don't doubt anyone counts that a major title. Um, but definitely don't see him getting pushed to the world title, unfortunately. Um, I think, you know, his time of maybe being the being a main eventer is probably over. Um, that pretty much got squashed after Triple H pretty much squashed him a couple times um, in their matches, which we didn't do it in a way where Triple H, I didn't mind it that Triple H had to go over in the matches, but Triple H booked it in a way where it didn't even help Umaga's credibility, whereas the John Cena and Umaga match from the Royal Rumble 2007, that was actually done in a way where it helped out Umaga and actually made him seem credible to be in there with a top star like John Cena and actually going after the world title. It actually made him seem credible, whereas the Triple H matches pretty much made him, you know, even though they were good matches in some, in some occasions, it was pretty much making him look like a joke, and Triple H pretty much buried and squashed him. Uh, not quick, but pretty, pretty much very quick in those matches, I would say. And the next question is uh, from... Death to Lita haters. Um, do you think Lita should return? And if she does, will she bring back the WWE's uh, Diva Division? I guess, you know, bring it back to prominence where it once was. Um, obviously, I don't see her returning to WWE or either making the jump to TNA, like I said. Said her career is probably most likely over as far as a wrestler, at least at this point, unless maybe she wants to return at some point down the line. But, you know, as far as WWE, WWE's women's division, uh, as far as their talent they have, I think, you know, they have some good talent as far as the Divas division or, you know, the women's division. But I think the thing is they have, you know, two women's titles, which is a waste to do. I don't understand why they do that. They should just have one and have the women on all, all, all to go on one brand. Either you do it in a way where you have, you know, uh, people for, women from Raw, women from SmackDown, they compete over the title and the champion goes back and forth to each brand, or, you know, just let the women that can work on one brand and the women that are pretty much, you know, just there for looks be on the other show. I think that's the way they should do it. Same with the tag team titles. I don't think there's necessary, I don't think it's um, necessary to have two tag team titles. Um, and pretty much like the two women's titles and two tag titles 
really devalues how much you know one of those titles means, even if they actually ever do something with either one, which they haven't done in a long time. And um, next question is from um, Dipset88, and he asks, A lot of people say Lil Wayne is the best rapper alive right now, but I think bigger names like Jay-Z, Nas, T.I. are better than him. I am a Lil Wayne fan, but sometimes his lyrics aren't really what I want to hear. As far as Lil Wayne being the best rapper alive, that is just a very big joke. Uh, can't I don't I don't see how anyone can even classify him being best rapper alive. Um, as a lot of people say, you know, if they try to defend and say he's the best rapper alive, not that many people can defend it in a way saying that he's deserving to be best rapper alive. Like if you say he's best rapper alive, you know, because of lyrically, that's false because he's not that good lyrically. Um, he's shown in some songs, like his mixtapes, Dedication 1 and Dedication 2, that he's done. You know, he showed that he could be lyrically good sometimes, but not a lyrical great. He's nowhere near, like, KRS-One or Rakim. And as far as, you know, probably being the, the best rapper, best rapper alive or, you know, best rappers, pretty much, you know, personal preference. If you like Lil Wayne, you do. If you don't like Lil Wayne, which I, can, I can't stand Lil Wayne at all. Now, I do like those two mixtapes he did. Dedication 1, Dedication 2, but other than that, he's never put anything out actually thought-provoking on any of his mainstream records, you know, dealing even back to the days where he did Cash Money Records. I mean, that's just trash rap, in my opinion. I don't like it that much. As far as, you know, Jay-Z, definitely a fan of him. Um, Nas, definitely a huge fan of his. Um, anyone that doesn't have the Nas Untitled album that came out, Back in July, I highly, highly, highly recommend you to go out and buy that CD and actually, you know, support Nas because that CD definitely deserves your support. As far as artists that I like, and I know you didn't ask this, I'm just adding this in. You know, artists that actually people should like if you're actually into hip hop and you're into actually the um, lyrical content. You know, check out artists like Immortal Technique, Dead Press, Paris, Public Enemy. Um, you know, Nas, Jay Z. Um, Ice Cube, um, I would say even Young Jeezy, even though I don't really will say his newest CD is that great, I think, you know, some stuff else from it has some substance, some, like, I would say half the CD's good and the other half is not that good, and, you know, the game, he's good, his new album is very disappointing, I thought, um, I know probably some people might have liked it, but compared to his albums he had before that, you know, th this album was very, very disappointing, now, on to the, um, Next uh, question is from, um, hopefully I'm saying this name right, it's um, Ian's uh, Y2J, I-A-N-I-S-Y2J, and um, asks, um, which movie do you think is better, Scarface or Godfather? I personally think Godfather is better, and why do you think WWE is, stopping, is um, staying away from extreme hardcore uh, matches? As far as which movie do I think is better, um, out of them two, easily Scarface. Um, so I'm a huge, I'm a huge uh, fan of that movie. A huge fan of Al Pacino. Um, Good, Goodfellas is good too. I like that. I mean, um, I like you know. But as far as you know, those type of films or I guess mob films or anything similar to that, mob or gangster films. As far as my favorite one, I would easily go with you know the Godfather and Godfather Two. Um, just stay away from God, Godfather Three. You know those. Those are the ones I like. You know, Reservoir Dogs is good as well. Um, the next question is from Jay Help, and he asks, um, "How come Larry Sweeney isn't with WWE or TNA um, right now? The man is uh, money on the mic and is a perfect. It will be a perfect mouthpiece for a monster heel like um, Kozlov or Umaga. And definitely, I gotta totally agree with you. If uh, Larry Sweeney isn't on WWE's radar, I don't understand what they're." not trying to want to get him, because obviously they're Ring of Honor wrestlers, and wrestlers on the independent circuit is always on WWE's radar, and this guy should definitely be on WWE's radar, but the one thing you might be able to blame where he's not, you know, picked up by WWE or TNA at this point is that, you know, neither company or in mainstream wrestling um, manager managerial roles haven't really been prominent in a long, long time. Um, you still have ballets, but as far as male managers... You don't really see that that much often as more at that mo much anymore. Um, you got you know Kali's interpreter, but that's pretty much probably one of the very few that you you know actually see 
in WWE that you know you would consider a manager, but that's more of you know interpreter, and he's playing that type of role. And at the same time, I guess you'd say manager as well. But definitely, you know, talent. He's a talent that I think would be gold in WWE. He could do a lot of good comical stuff. And like you said, you know, the talent like Umaga or Kozlov. Hell, I'm not even a fan of Kozlov, but Larry Schwinney could be one of those guys. You know, I think I would say he's like this generation's Bobby the Brain Heaton. He can be he he can be those that one guy that actually you know can build someone up just on the mic from what he says and will make them at least seem credible the way Bobby the Brain Heaton did. You know, uh, he man Bobby the Brain Heaton managed some wrestlers that weren't that good, but the way he was on the mic, you know, he definitely built them up a way where you you wanted to hate him. You you hated Bobby the Brain Heaton. Larry Sweeney I think does the same job and. I think he would be excellent in WWE or TNA if, you know, either company was ever looking for, you know, a top manager for one of their wrestlers as far as, like, a wrestler that does, doesn't have a, you know, talking, um, you know, talking role and needs a mouthpiece. You know, Abyss had, you know, a great manager with Jim Mitchell, but they don't have, TNA doesn't have him anymore, unfortunately. Um, next question is from CC Titans Fan, um, and he asks, uh, what, what are your thoughts on Brock Lesnar winning the UFC title? Well, I'm not a huge MMA fan, but I do follow UFC from time to time. And Brock Lesnar won the title, I think, is definitely a good thing, showcasing that, you know, a wrestler from actually formerly from WWE or, you know, a wrestling organization. And But he obviously has complete, um, actually has, you know, past uh, wrestling um, knowledge with him with um, his NCAA time he did in Michigan. So, Obviously, you know, he had skills before WWE, so it's not like, you know, this was a actually, you know, just WWE wrestler and trained to be, you know, WWE worker, you know, winning the UFC title. He actually had skills back, you know, dating to his stuff he did in the NCAA um, and NCAA wrestling. So, obviously, you know, he had skills for this, and, you know, he's built like a beast, and, you know, he's one of the guys I would say that he's not going to shock me if he holds on that title for a long time, because, it's going to be a long time, I think, till someone defeats him. Um, but, you know, the way UFC goes, the way, you know, boxing or anything goes, you know, anything could happen. So um, he could he could shock, he could be, um, you know, he could be beat by someone like, you know, Mike Tyson did by Buster Douglas. It could be something like that. It could be a huge shocker. He could be coming out of nowhere. But um, for the most part, I see him holding on to that title for a long time. Um, next question is from Cole Glenn. Um, where do you think Christian Cage will end up? Well, see, before this, I would say, you know, if he, since he didn't show up at Final Resolution, which was a time I thought maybe he would have shown up if this was an angle and him come back to TNA, and they'll play it off that way. So now it's looking more likely he's going to go back to WWE, especially since um, WWE has recently signed to, um, Tomko back. So I don't think they would sign Tomko unless maybe they got Christian. I guess they're going to be having... The same thing, Christian's going to be um, having Tomko play his bodyguard again. That's if Christian Cage goes to WWE, but it's looking more like this wasn't an angle and TNA actually rid him off, but you never know, maybe TNA's, you know, waiting for this to um, build up and have him surprisingly return, you know, a month or two later, maybe in January or February, but um, it's looking more likely now he's going to be going to WWE, at least the way it's looking. Uh, next question is from the same person is um, um, who will, and in your opinion, who should be the one to take the ROH title from Nigel McGinnis? Um, as far as wrestler, I think that should defeat him. I would definitely say Tyler Black. Tyler Black is definitely a very young wrestler, very talented, and I think he would definitely be worthy of holding that ROH world title and definitely showcase earlier this year against Nigel McGinnis and taking a prisoner's pay-per-view that he definitely could um, stand in that ring with, you know, talents like Nigel McGinnis and, you know, matches with Brian Danielson had over this over this year. Their series of matches definitely proved he's a great talent, and I definitely think he would be worthy of holding that. Obviously, if they do that, he'll go on the route of, obviously, I guess, being like high, um, Necro Butcher, and I guess turning face at some point down the line, which they're kind of, you know, starting to slowly tease it already. So possibly him, you know, other ones maybe, you know, First time ever, you know, two-time ROH champion. Maybe Brian Danielson would defeat him or Austin Aries, but both of them has already, you know, received shots against Nigel McGinnis, I think, several times or at least one or two times each. So I um, don't know if they'll, you know, have, you know, one of them to defeat him. So it's looking like someone like Tyler Black could possibly be one to dethrone Nigel the title. 
Possibly Kevin Steen. I wouldn't mind him being one either. And um, next question is from 2004-06-324. I realize that you're not a fan of primetime, and neither am I for that matter, but do you feel as though primetime can get a be bigger and better push and made, it made seem to be a credible tag team um, if they were in either TNA or ROH than getting in WWE in their um, present moment. As far as TNA and, or Ring of Honor, I don't think they would, I don't, definitely don't think they would work in Ring of Honor. I don't think anyone would want to see them there. TNA, they might work, um, but as far as um, WWE, I think their present state is probably the best they're going to be for a little bit. WWE needs to notice at some point or another they are the most over tag team in WWE and they should start, you know, pushing them. I don't understand why they don't. I'm not, not a fan of them, but WWE should notice that fans like them enough where, you know, it's just the tag titles. It's not like, you know, anyone cares about the tag titles and they're not that terrible of a team. And um, next question is from Drill Bits. Um, I think that's the way it is. It's DR. N L L B N K S and um, two questions. Uh, if you could uh, book any horrible um, moment in wrestling history, how would you make it better, and what moment would it be? Um, as far as this, um, I thought about a couple things, but probably the one that I thought about the most, which was the angle that seemed like it could have had a little promise if it was booked right, and that was the WWE Invasion of 2001, which you could blame that on WWE's uh, piss poor booking of the angle. And another way you can blame it, it was on, obviously, the Time Warner contracts that a lot of the big WCW stars like Bill Goldberg and a couple others were still hooked under. So if WWE wanted to do the WCW type thing back then, they couldn't have had those stars. So it was kind of their fault. They shouldn't have rushed it. I think maybe if they would have held it off till the Time Warner contracts finally ended, which I think most of them ended at least you know, late 2002. And I think WCW's name was still a little prominent. And maybe if you would have waited until then, but I understand maybe for story, maybe for ratings wise, WWE wanted to try to gain some of those uh, fans that just tuned out of wrestling and maybe were former you know WCW fans. And I understand why they did it, but they should have done booked it a whole lot better, especially you know some of the swerves they did in with Austin, you know, joined the alliance. And the whole alliance thing was a complete joke. Um, you know, they shouldn't have even done the angle. Now I don't mind. I didn't mind ECW ever being a portion of it, but Pretty much most fans and the fan base of that Monday Night War era obviously were focusing on WCW versus WWF. Now WWE, they weren't focusing on ECW. ECW was kind of, you know, alternative, even though it was revolutionary and it was kind of counterculture and it was against WWE and um, WCW at, at the same time. It was still, you know, an alternative. It probably would have worked out better if the angle was just... WWE slash WWF, I mean, versus WCW, it probably would have worked out maybe a little better. And maybe got ECW involved in a way where they might have done run-ins or something. Something on the lines like that probably could have worked out. You know, that's one of those angles that, um, due to, you know, the Tom Horner contracts and a couple other things they did in it, you know, just was terrible. And the whole, you know, thing they did with uh, Diamond Dallas Page and Undertaker, the whole stalker of Sarah angle they did, that was terrible. So... There was some okay, it, it had, you know, prominence to it where, you know, it would get fans talking, but it didn't deliver to the level it should have. And the next question is from the same person. Um, any thoughts on the um, Fallen Angel getting added to the Main Event Mafia storyline? I guess you're asking, would I like to see him get, a part, get added into the storyline with the Main Event Mafia and I guess being a part of the front line? Definitely I would like Christopher Daniels to be a part of that storyline, definitely coming back joining the front line, and he would definitely be a great mouthpiece to the front line. I think a lot of people would much rather see him be the mouthpiece other than fucking Rhino, which I don't understand. Why the hell does Rhino, he's getting a world title shot at Final Resolution, not Final Resolution, but the Genesis pay-per-view coming up in January. Yeah, Rhino versus Sting TNA is really going to garner you some buy rates. Didn't you notice that when you ran this match on free TV that this was the lowest rated portion of your show and people tuned out as far as soon as they noticed, hey, Ron is in the main event. I'm, I'm flipping this shit. So, you know, they should notice that people don't want to see Rhino in a world title picture. Um, and I don't see how they are going to even build this pay-per-view up with that match probably being the main event. Unless maybe they're doing some type of tag match as the main event. Don't understand why they want to do that. 
Next question is um, from um, Big Daddy's uh, Big Daddy uh, 0207, and there's three questions. Um, who and what are um, who and what are uh, currently pulling hip hop further away from where it started? As far as that easily question is mainstream hip hop. What you see on BET, what you see on MTV, MTV Jams, any of those type of networks. Um, what you see, you know, a lot of the mainstream um, networks that actually maybe endorse a little um, hip hop, you know, stuff like the Grammys. When Lil Wayne gets a, you know, Grammy nomination for album of the year, that's just a complete joke, and that's one of the people that's bringing down hip hop. Him, Soldier Boy, and a couple other ones. There's a lot of other ones. There's some that are trying to keep it live, like I said earlier, like some artists that I would say check out if you actually want to see some, hear, listen to some good artists, you know. Go back and listen to some old school artists like um, Rock Kim, uh, Big Daddy Kane, Public Enemy. Uh, listen to um, some rappers um, that are still out there today like uh, Paris. Um, listen to uh, Mortal Technique, Dead Prez. Um, listen to Nas, um, Jay Z, uh, Saigon, Pat Poos. And speaking of those last two, Saigon and Pat Poos. Hopefully in the year 2009, hopefully we'll finally get some record label to actually put out their um, CD because they keep getting keep getting fucked by their record labels. Um, you know, Pat Pussy got out his Jive deal, and I guess right now he's trying to surface around to get a get a deal with some um, company. But I would say come out on come out independently. That's the way your album will will probably sell. You know, you got a good enough buzz. And you'll make more actually with an independent record than actually putting it out with a mainstream distribution like Def Jam or something. You would make a whole lot more money selling, you know, 100,000 records as opposed to going gold or platinum in most cases. And I think that's the route he should probably go with his CD Saigon. Yeah, I think he just recently, you know, a couple months ago, earlier this year, finally got out of his Atlantic deal that, you know, Atlantic did, did the same thing they did with Pat Poos where they wanted. Both of them to switch up their styles. Neither one wanted to do it. They wanted to keep to their style of hip hop and didn't want to, you know, go some mainstream route. And I definitely got to respect them both for that, you know, musically and that they were actually willing to do that. Especially since how much money they probably got offered to probably change their styles up. But definitely got to respect them for, you know, respecting the music. And you know, it's good to see some artists do that. You know, another one, Lupe Fiasco, another artist that, you know. He has a deal with, uh, I think, you know, one of the, uh, I think, Def Jam or some, um, or maybe Interscope or something. He has something involved with Jay-Z or something. So, uh, obviously, he's one one uh, rapper that should be selling more than what he does, especially with the content he puts out. Ice Cube's still a good artist. You know, his his recent album and the one before that, he um, is one of the rappers that are uh, releasing his stuff independently on his own record label, which is Probably the smartest thing for a lot of rappers as far as rappers that um, have thought-provoking stuff. It's probably the best way for them to release their content nowadays is through um, independent distribution on either a web, on either their own website or, you know, on their own independent rec record label. They own, like, you know, Paris with Gorilla Funk, um, Moral Technique. I think, you know, they have some type of deal with so some record companies still pretty much independent is his uh he uh is pretty much independent artist as well has some distribution with you know best buy and stuff which helps out them two artists but definitely it's good to see you know hopefully and next year we'll see you know papoose and saigon finally come out with their album that um the dots of dreams from papoose and the greatest story never told from saigon two albums that i've been waiting for for god knows how long I've been waiting for Saigon's album since ever he started hyping it up back probably in 03 or 04. Pat Poos probably since, you know, 05 or 06. That's how long I've been waiting for his album. And as far as the um, next question is, um, what would you do with the Motors and Machine Guns and their current storyline? Um, as far as this, um, obviously if you have to run with it the way it is now, um, you could do it in a way, build it up where, um, you know, TNA management or someone's against them. Um, or some ways or another, then they have to prove themselves by defeating certain tag teams, getting wins and ranking up wins, and finally getting a world tag team title shot and getting it that way. Hopefully they don't go the route of breaking this team up, because this is one of those teams, even though I like both of them as singles competitors, I think you know both of them as tag teams work out even better. They showcase how even better 
and how much more talent they are with each other. Um, Alex Shelley, I think he could branch off and do stuff single singles lead since you know he's a good wrestler and he's good on the mic. Saban, I think he would just go back and be pretty much a stagnant wrestler. And then hopefully they got some good plans with it. Um, obviously it's going to be one of those things we'll have to wait and see. Hopefully they're not going to be burying them or their contracts coming up soon. And then. Next question is from the same person. If you could uh, pick up any of the um, recent um, released talent from WWE, um, who would they be and why? As far as um, talent that's got released, you know, recently or ha is released from WWE, I would say um, definitely uh, one I would like to pick up either for Ring of Honor or TNA would be Paul London. But unfortunately, at this time, it looks like you know he's going to be taking a little break from his wrestling career. And he's going to be focusing on being a stunt um, stunt man for um, Hollywood movies. So it looks like he's going to be focusing on that more than wrestling. So obviously, you know, it looks like it's you couldn't pick him up even if you wanted to. Um, Elijah Burke's definitely a talent that you know Ring of Honor or TNA should pick up. I would. would that's actually there's very few wrestlers that get released from WWE that actually were WWE wrestlers that I wouldn't I wouldn't mind seeing in Ring of Honor. I definitely would like to see Elijah there. I like to see him in TNA. He's definitely one talent that, you know, some company needs to do something with because he's very, very talented on the mic and especially in the ring as well. Um, and definitely could, definitely could, you know, get crowd, he definitely can get a crowd attention as well. And then um, there's a, uh, next question is from RTM614, and there's two questions. These are the final two of this Q&A. Um, who would you like to see be the breakout star in 2009? in both WWE and TNA as far as WWE. Um, as far as breakout star, I would say, you know, Evan Bourne, but he's already had probably a breakout year, I would say. But definitely a star I like to see have a breakout year. Um, and I know I've pretty much praised him a lot. And probably I'm probably one of the people that praise him a lot, and that's uh, Ted DiBiase Jr. Just like his work a lot. I liked his work before he even got into WWE stuff he did in uh, WWE's developmental territories and the stuff he did in Pro Wrestling Noah. Definitely a big fan of his, so I wouldn't mind see him get a break. Um, I know some people don't like Cody Rhodes, but I think you know if he can get a little better wrestling skill and get a little better mic skills, I wouldn't mind see him being a breakout star. As far as TNA, um, the person I like to see be the breakout star is already kind of a breakout star, but when I mean a breakout star, I want them to go to the level of not being the X Division anymore and actually be considered, you know, in the world title pitcher and the world title hunt, and that's Jay Lethal. I think he's Definitely worthy of starting to break from the X Division and go to the world title pitcher. I think he's definitely worthy of it, and I would love to see it happen. Um, and at some point or another, we'll probably see it in the future. I don't know if we'll see it in 2009. Hopefully we will, though, because he definitely is a very talented wrestler. Him and Joe could do some excellent stuff, um, since they did do some good stuff in Ring of Honor with each other. And um, him and AJ Styles would do some good stuff. And I would actually like to see him and Sting, actually, in you know a match that gets... You know, a good amount of time and a good amount of build. And I think them two could put on something good between each other. And um, the last question is from the same person, is um, from RTM614. Is um, Who do you believe uh, are some of the most underutilized talents in WWE? Well, there's a huge list of underutilized talents in WWE. Um, I would say a lot of them probably recently got fired, you know, like the Paul Londons and the Elijah Burks. Still, they got a couple, you know, underutilized talents like MVP. I think they should be doing more with him instead of him being in a losing streak gimmick. And um, Brian Kendricks, I think he could be doing a whole lot better. You know, he had a mega push to now, you know, where is he at? He's back kind of in mid-card status. Um, and there's, you know, a couple other stars probably as well that can't really come to my head at this point. But definitely those two, MVP and the Brian Kendricks, are two that I would like to see utilized a whole lot better in WWE. Um, and that's it for this Q&A for this week. Um, send in your questions for my next Q&A, which I'll probably at least do one more Q&A um, by the end of the year. And um, either send your questions through a comment on my channel, comment on this video, or through a personal message. And that's it. I right, Peace.